Hercule Poirot became a favorite of the silver screen when the character appeared in the 1974 feature film Murder on the Orient Express, but when Albert Finney didn't return to the role, he was succeeded by Peter Ustinov. Ustinov played Poirot six times in three feature films and three TV movies. His last portrayal was in 1988's Appointment with Death, which we're going to take a look at today. Except, the TV series Agatha Christie's Poirot also made a version of Appointment with Death in 2008, starring David Suchet. Which one of them is the better adaptation? Different question. Which one of them is the better film? Who used to be so popular? Appointment with Death, also titled A Date with Death, was the 16th novel starring Poirot, published in 1938. In 1945, it was adapted into a stage play by Agatha Christie herself, and it's the only time Christie ever changed the murderer in one of her stories. Okay, that's not quite true, but anyway. A young woman, Dr. Sarah King, has just broken off her engagement and is sightseeing in Jerusalem in order to forget her heartache. She meets an older man, Dr. Gerard, with whom she shares an attraction, but her attention is drawn to a strange American family who's also sightseeing, the Boyntons. Her main interest is in Raymond Boynton, but there's something odd about the way he and his siblings, Lennox, Carol, and Ginevra, and Lennox's wife, Nadine, all behave around the family matriarch, Emily Boynton. Emily is the stepmother to all the siblings except Ginevra, her daughter. It soon becomes apparent that Emily possesses a unique blend of sadism and skillful emotional manipulation. Not gaslighting. The Boyntons are fully aware of what Emily is doing. She wouldn't have it any other way. But definite emotional control. It's... that is, she is... frightening. Also on the scene is family friend Jefferson Cope. He's concerned for the Boyntons, Nadine in particular, for whom he has romantic feelings. He makes it clear that things are platonic between them, but if she ever decides to leave Lennox, he's standing by. Because she's unable to control Nadine the way she controls the others, Emily encourages an affair between Cope and Nadine so that Nadine will leave the family. Sarah and Dr. Gerard book a trip to Petra at the same time as the Boyntons. Accompanying them are Lady Westholm, an imperious British MP who was born in America, and another sightseer named Miss Pierce. Just before they all start out, on impulse, Sarah tells Emily Boynton to her face just how horrible she is. Emily's response is... I never forget. Remember that. Not an action... Not a name, not a face. At Petra, Emily surprises everyone by suggesting they go off to enjoy themselves. Sarah finds herself alone with Raymond, who resolves to finally break away from his mother, but he insists he has to do it on his own. When everyone returns to the camp for dinner, a servant says Emily won't wake up. Sarah goes to check on her, then returns and announces that Emily has died. Let's start by looking at the Peter Ustinov adaptation, which features an all-star cast, including Lauren Bacall, Haley Mills, Sir John Gielgud, and Carrie Fisher. Emily Boynton is played by Piper Laurie, who you might know as the mother from Stephen King's Carrie. So that fits. If you haven't read the book, the opening shot might mislead you into thinking this is a murder-in-the-manner mystery. The film story begins weeks before the characters arrive in Jerusalem, and it sets things up much more in the style of Knives Out. Emily's husband has just passed away. His last will would give the Boynton children financial freedom, but Emily blackmails Cope, who is now the family lawyer, into destroying the will. Later we'll find out he also did it to persuade Nadine to leave her husband. Rather than standing by, Cope and Nadine are having a full-on affair. Likewise, with the Boynton family, the film doesn't quite nail it. Emily is just as toxic and dominating, but the children aren't nearly so cowed, as the book put it. The way Emily controls them is more material than psychological, making it harder to feel sorry for them. I think the only thing that saves this aspect of the film is Piper Laurie's unsettling presence. As for the other characters, the film gets Sarah King and Lady Westholm exactly right, and Poirot fills in for Dr. Gerard in terms of his friendship with Sarah, without the sexual attraction, of course. Peter Ustinov is often referred to as the funny Poirot. 
but in my opinion he has much more to offer than just comic relief. While physically he might not match the character's literary description, he's just as believable in the role as Finney or Suchet. He's sharp, shamelessly nosy, unwilling to take things at face value, gentle when he can be, and stern when he needs to be. Out of all the Poirots, he's probably the warmest and friendliest, which in a way makes it more powerful when he delivers the solution and accuses the murderer. The film extends the sightseeing trip to include a boat voyage, during which Cope begins to grow a conscience, and Emily, who in this version is against an affair between him and Nandine, tries to murder him! He's saved by a fistfight with Lennox, something book Lennox would have been incapable of. After that, there's another little subplot that doesn't go anywhere, involving Cope flirting with Miss Pierce and the two of them briefly going missing. Miss Pierce's name has been changed to Miss Quentin, and she's now Lady Westholm's assistant, as well as an archaeologist. Not sure why they needed that. The last big change for the first act is that while the book left open the possibility that Sarah killed Emily when she discovered the body, the film exonerates her right away. Now for the more recent version. The last time I compared a Suchet film to a feature film, the Suchet version stuck religiously to the original story. <clears throat> Not the case here. Listing all the differences would take forever, so broad strokes... Emily's husband is alive and well, played by Tim Curry. He's the lead archaeologist at a dig in Jerusalem, Syria. Raymond, Carol, and Ginevra are all adopted. Lennox, now Leonard, is Tim Curry's son, and Nadine is left out. The subtle psychological torture from the book is much diluted with physical abuse and lingering PTSD. The family drama seems to take a back seat to the archaeology, which attracts Sarah King, Dr. Gerard, some creepy nun, and Dame Celia Westholm, a celebrity traveler who uses subtle means to antagonize Emily. <sighs> I miss Lorne Bacall. Nevertheless, out of all the entries in the Suchet series, the way it's directed, I suppose, this one feels the most, well, theatrical, perhaps even more so than its theatrical counterpart. If you can manage to forget the story it's based on, you start to feel swept up by the drama. The only time the story starts to resemble the book again is when all the characters go off and do their own thing while Emily sits watching everyone from on high, an iconic image given by Agatha Christie. Except in the book, in the hours before she was found dead, several of the suspects came and talked to her one at a time. Here, no one goes to her except her husband, who comes down horrified, his hands covered in blood. Sarah and Celia go up and confirm she's been stabbed. Going back to the book, it seems Emily Boynton died of heart failure, but Dr. Gerard says some digitoxin is missing from his medical bag, as well as a hypodermic syringe, except the latter was returned. Emily has a puncture mark on her wrist. Worried that there might have been foul play, Colonel Carberry, head of local law enforcement, turns to Poirot, who is visiting, and asks him to look into it. Poirot questions the suspects, all of whom insist Emily died a natural death. Nearly all of them say they spoke to Emily shortly before she died, but the stories ring false and tend to contradict each other. For example, Raymond says he saw Emily alive at a time when Sarah claims she must have been dead. Poirot is especially interested in Raymond, as he had earlier overheard a conversation in which Raymond and Carol discussed murdering their stepmother. One other thing that interests him is that apparently one of the native servants got into an argument with Emily at some point, but no one knows exactly which servant it was, and Emily never mentioned it to any of the family members who spoke to her. Sarah laments that even though Emily is dead, she's still tormenting her children by way of bringing them under suspicion for her murder. However, Poirot announces his case is complete and gathers everyone to explain the solution. The Ustinov version of this sequence is very well dramatized. The interrogations capture the dialogue pretty accurately without making it rote verse, and make good use of flashbacks. It's a pity they skipped the scene where Poirot interrogates Ginevra, although hers is a part that would be incredibly difficult to portray on screen. That's probably why her part is diminished in the film. Another thing the movie leaves out is a backstory about Emily throwing a pregnant governess out of the house just weeks before she was due. Later, Miss Pierce mentions that she used to be a governess, but her film counterpart doesn't have any suspicion cast on her at all.
There's also a scene where Poirot pretends to test Miss Pierce's powers of observation by asking if she'd noticed when he sneezed, and she says yes, except he hadn't sneezed. This is replaced in the film when Poirot asks if Miss Quentin saw a non-existent spider. The last big change in this act is that the film adds a second murder. An Arab man asks to meet Poirot, but he changes his mind at the last moment and runs off. After a ridiculous chase scene, he's shot. Sarah is found standing over the body with a gun, but Poirot says she's innocent of this crime. In the Suchet version, the second act bears little, if any, resemblance to the book. The one and only event that's consistent is that an unknown Arab was reported to have gone up and spoken to Mrs. Boynton, but it was quite a while before the time of death. Again, too many differences to enumerate, so main beats. Mrs. Boynton's Wall Street stock is crashed. The skull of somebody famous is found in the tomb. And someone tries to abduct Ginevra, who defends herself and ends up striking the nun. Also, instead of Mrs. Boynton being a sadist, her motivation for tormenting her now-adopted children was apparently to punish them for not being her own flesh and blood. Carol remembers there was a fourth adopted child who was severely beaten and then sent away. The only person who might know that child's identity is the nanny who enacted the beating under Mrs. Boynton's direction. But before the nanny can disclose the name, she drowns herself. In the book, it turns out Poirot knew from the beginning that the Boynton family was innocent. The theft of the digitoxin implicated them, since Emily's death could be attributed to an overdose of her medication, but if it had been one of them, there would have been no need to use a hypodermic. They could have just tampered with the medicine itself. What confused the issue was that all the Boyntons and Sarah lied to try and protect each other, which made them look even more guilty. Poirot's goal all along has been to prove them innocent. Poirot points out that Emily Boynton's threatening words to Sarah actually make no sense whatsoever, unless she was speaking not to Sarah, but to someone standing behind her. There had been signs that, for Emily, tormenting her children was getting old, boring. She found a new victim in Lady Westholm, who in fact used to be in prison, a secret known by very few and which would destroy her career if it became public. Lady Westholm disguised herself as an Arab so that no one would see her approach Emily within the time frame of the murder. She concocted an alibi by exploiting Miss Pierce's suggestibility. She grunted like a pig. Most offensive. Lady Westholm overhears Poirot expose her as the murderer, and she commits suicide. Five years later, we see the Boyntons as a sane, happy, well-adjusted family. Sarah has married Raymond. Nadine and Lennox have kids. Carol has married Jefferson Cope. Okay. And Ginevra is a famous actress. Sarah realizes at long last that Ginevra has much the same ability to influence people as Emily did, except Ginevra chooses to use her gifts for good instead of evil. I thought that was a nice touch. While the Ustinov film leaves out the epilogue, it includes everything else, and does a pretty good job of it, too. I really like how Poirot demonstrates how the murderer threw together a disguise, and seeing this from across the room is what clues in Lady Westholm that he's figured it out. Of course, you can't give Lauren Bacall an off-screen death without some sort of confrontation. She's better dead. The family rejoice. Should I be the only one to suffer? Um... There was the second person you killed, you jerk. Of course, that second murder was probably the weakest part of the movie. The Suchet film reaches its denouement as other Agatha Christie's do, by getting all the red herrings out of the way and letting the important clues stand out. Leonard Boynton planted fake artifacts for his father to find so he'd start paying attention to his son. The fourth Boynton child turns out to be Jefferson Cope, who was the architect behind the collapse of Lady Boynton's financial empire. The nun wasn't trying to save Ginevra from being abducted. She was the abductor herself, and Ginevra striking her was no accident. The nun is really part of a sex trafficking ring. Now, remember the governess in the Boynton household who became pregnant and was thrown out? She more or less makes her way into the solution, because here, Dame Celia Westholm was that governess, but in this case she wasn't thrown out until after she gave birth, and the baby stayed with Mrs. Boynton, and was named Ginevra. This is cool. 
It's totally cheating in terms of a murder mystery, because there are no proper clues to lead to the solution. But for someone who's read the book, this is a great Easter egg. And it's not the only one. One Poirot short story that never received a true adaptation was The Le Miserier Inheritance. In that story... Uh, Spoiler warning. In that story, the murderer attempts to kill someone by pretending there's a wasp on the back of his neck in order to mask a hypodermic injection, which is supposedly the sting. This is how Celia and Dr. Gerard, who's revealed to be Geneva's father, paralyzed Lady Boynton and let her roast in the sun for hours. Disguised as an Arab, Dr. Gerard planted a ball of wax filled with goat's blood so that when Tim Curry found her, the wax had melted and she appeared to be dead. Celia herself stabbed her in the few seconds seconds before Sarah followed her up the ladder. The two parents wanted revenge on the woman who had made their daughter's life a living hell. Later, Dr. Gerard would use drugs to incite the nanny to commit suicide. When Poirot exposes them, they do likewise, using digitalis, perhaps as a final nod to the source material. Well, the question of which is the better adaptation can be done away with, because the David Suchet version does not count as an adaptation at all. Even though some of the characters share the same names, this is an entirely different story. As to which is the better film... Hmm. I'm quite fond of the older version. It was the first one I saw with Peter Ustinov. But this one is so well-directed. It's breathtaking. Maybe not a great murder mystery, but as a drama, it makes you feel things. Against the acting powerhouse of its predecessor, it offers some worthy competition in its performances. I'm going to have to say it. Of the two, the better film, just as a film, is... Poirot, what are you doing? What are you doing? There is nothing in the world so damaged that it cannot be repaired by the hand of Almighty God. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? They turned Poirot into a television evangelist? Okay, I'm aware that the later Poirot adaptations decided to focus more on his Catholicism, but to be honest, that makes me uncomfortable. It's not at all the same thing as Father Brown or Brother Cadvile, two fictional detectives who were Christian and Catholic by conception. If one of them, or someone in real life, offered me comfort by telling me their deity could heal me, I would take it in the spirit they intended. But taking those words and putting them in the mouth of someone who never, in any canonical story, ever invoked religion as something other than a personal practice, that does not bespeak kindness. I would love to say, just ignore this last part, but I'm not going to. I recommend avoiding this film altogether. Watch the other adaptation. It's not perfect, but it's fine. In a slight bit of irony, I apologize for ending this video with a sermon. If you feel like coming back, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.